And now, uh, welcome. Here's here comes. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and uh, thank you, Shannon. So today we'll have uh, Shannon O'Brien talk. So Shannon's uh, got her right, her bachelor's at, in environment in ecology and environmental science at the University of Maine, and uh, started as a technician at Strudic Institute as uh, kind of has followed this early career path that she's going to talk about. So started as a technician in 2020, and now as a permanent um, employee at Strudic Institute. Um, and we're very lucky to have her. And so look forward to uh, what you have to say today. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Yes, and I'm grateful for my time at Scudis as a tech and that it's continued and grown into something new. Um, so to give it away. I'm going to be talking about early career experiences today. I'm talking to some in the room, but I'm also trying to look at the owl so people online is eye contact. So I apologize if I look a bit awkward for most mm -hmm. in the room. But, um, let's jump into it. Oh, oh that's too far. Okay, just to break it down, it gave you a little bit, but I wanted to just share who I am and why I'm here talking to you about early experiences with scooting. And and, to try to do that. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so I did graduate you made in 2020. I'm not from Maine, but I was able to stick around mm -hmm. in the state through my first technicianship at Scudic. I was able to get a second one in 21. It's fairly rare to get two in a row, so I was just grateful. Um, and through that, I continued my work with them remotely through assisting right after my technicianship. So I never really left Scooting in some ways. I've always been around since 2020 in some capacity. But last year in 22, um, in April, a coordinator position opened full time. And I thought, that sounds great. I already love this place, and I know a whole bunch about it, so let me go for it. And luckily, I was accepted, and I've been in that position now um, for over like a year, and we're going up on a year and a half. So that's me. There I am holding some of my favorite creatures in Acadia, which is the Jonah crabs. There's a tiny one in one hand and a huge one in another. I encourage you to go find tiny ones. They're super funny. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not what I'll be talking about today. Mm -hmm. Today, I'll be giving a short preview on the scooting, if you're just unfamiliar with us. Uh, what is an early career person in general? early career, early scudics, early career positions, and then just a sneak peek at how we have them. So if you're not familiar or you haven't been able to visit Scudic already, I encourage you to do so. It's about an hour and 10 minutes away by Google's estimate. Um, and the base is, the campus used to be a Navy base, which is quite unique, I find. We have a water tower and everything. I think we could kind of cut off for a few months and survive somehow out there, but we don't. We are a meeting space for people to come see us. It's a small bustling community at the very end of an isolated peninsula. So it's an interesting place to be. I know on the island here, you all have a quiet side, but I think we're the true quiet side because we give ourselves that one hour drive away. We're also primary partner um, in science research, education, and little communication in the park here. And with that status, we are a research learning center within the park system. There is 18 of them in total. We're the largest, and to my knowledge, the only one with a nonprofit relationship. With that, we're able to offer opportunities to come visit our campus and hear from a public program. We have one tonight. It's going to be a lovely flute player. Other nights, it's a whale biologist. Later this year, it's a bird biologist. So we invite people to come and join us and learn about those. Also, we host many other learning opportunities. We'll get into that fall more in the traditional education sense. So early career. I'm just going to spend a few minutes kind of moving through what that means and what we consider it at Scudic. It's kind of a difficult subject to put a definition to. So. There are people trying to put a definition to it. Um, it ranges no matter who you look at, they'll tell you something different. It seems to go from zero to 10 years. ESA, Ecological Society of America, says it's eight years after you've completed your graduate degree, uh, your doctorate. I think that starts a little late. That student be considered to be a little sooner. So just different frames of the same word. And I think the easiest way to break it down is by title, and the titles you have for your career as an ecologist. 
early career folks are usually technicians, interns, sometimes a fellow. Fellow's a tricky one. There's a lot of different fellowships. And then when you have that full-time professional gig, you're going to be an associate, a scientist, biologist, specialist. You get that more concise title. Just a note, technician, we often call them techs at Scudic. So if I do that, that is what I'm referring to. And we also call this overarching title that encompasses all of them, early career professionals, ECPs. I say that daily in my work. So if I do say it here, I apologize, but hopefully it looks like it. So what is this person or who are they really? At SCUDIC, we consider them currently working toward, so in school or within X years of a bachelor degree. I think there's a lot of disagreement between three and five years after the bachelor's seems to be where SCUDIC lands. Um, they're likely seeking many opportunities to find an ideal fit. I often think of these people as trying to figure out what kind of field of study they want to jump into or an employer. They could go to the government, nonprofit, private, lots of options ahead, and maybe they haven't picked their path right yet. In ecology, I often associate these jobs with seasonal, switching locations in, in jobs somewhat frequently, up to three times a year sometimes. So the big question for you is how many years does this phase last? And how to make the jump? How do we get folks from technicians to associates? And I'm really focusing on this because I think to make that jump, it takes a lot of support and mentorship and structure. And if we don't know who they are, we can't provide that to make sure that they advance forward and become the next generation of conservation leaders. So another way to look at this, and I think the more traditional way to look at this is the jump is actually three steps. <laughs> it's you, a tech or an intern, and that cycles back in on itself. Many people do many years of it before advancing. Then you go to graduate school and you figured out your employer in your field. You have that in mind, you're going to go get the degree to advance in that field. And then the elusive full-time professional, which I'm going to spend a different presentation defining that, uh, you, you know, you've made it and now you have a full-time job and you can establish a life wherever you've landed. I think this is the traditional one. There's a few other pathways. You'll see one green line jumps up from tech and intern and drops down into professional. Maybe I'm there. I advanced at student and was able to get a full time position without a degree. I'm a little scared to think of myself as anything other than a really career, but it's quite possible. I don't think I'm making too hard of assumptions on this. 14 out of 25 interviews that I sat in when asked the question, where do you see yourself in three years? They said grad school because I think they know the next step to get to a career in this field. So just to know did the others imagine that they were going to skip grad school or were they just uncertain? Thank you for asking. There's three people who said maybe. I didn't, they weren't confirmed enough for me to count them as going. And then others either wanted to jump straight into conservation work full time, or we also interview educators and science communicators where they don't often think of things as a seasonal job or grad school as a requirement because they run in a different field than like field ecologists do. But yeah, great question. Many of them also in this 14 knew that they would be or see they'll be in a PhD program. Not only masters, they want to be on a PhD in the next three years. So what happens when this kind of breaks apart though, and people kind of fall out because there's just not as many of the conservation leaders as there are the young conservation leaders. So why don't they advance? And often these jobs are low wages or volunteer only in some situations. You need housing. I think people on the island can feel this. You live in a vacation area, but you're making, you know, you're not vacationing here. You're trying to live. So the housing just isn't available. Or if Scudic were able to offer housing, we're in quite a rural spot. There's not a lot of housing to be had. Um, so that's often a problem. Maybe you cannot travel across the country a few times a year or even a region because you need to plant yourself and your family for, for whatever reason. You just don't want to launch yourself across the country a few times. There's also a bit of a lack of stability. These positions are seasonal. And with that, you're going to be job hunting while you're working. And that's almost like a continuous kind of grading cycle. And then when you are job hunting, it's super competitive. So it feels like you have a lot of barriers um, kind of preventing that advancement. And I feel as if that is why a lot of people don't. So 
No worries, we're gonna get to the good parts. So early career at Scudic. <laughs> so here is kind of a circular of everything we offer on our campus or through us. You'll notice there's some symbols next to some of the jobs. So Netton is Northeastern Temperate Network. They're traveling technicians. They don't actually live on our campus because they're often on the move. When they do come around here, they keep the teachers with us. And then C, which stands for Scudic Education Adventure. It's an immersive education program um, run for middle schoolers on our campus. It's three days, two nights. Really delightful. And all of their staff, uh, seasonal staff, live on our campus. Everything else is kind of run and mentored and supported and supervised by Scudic employees. I'll note that there's another symbol hiding there in the bottom. And that's a scientist in park. That's a more collaborative position because it involves the park service and it's actually funded and run through AmeriCorps. So they're a little bit different, but we'll still include them. <laughs> the positions I'm gonna talk about today are the ones that just highlighted in yellow uh, because I, yeah, I have the most knowledge of them because we do supervise and have these positions in house. So, loads of text, do apologize. But these are the three positions broken down more generally into intern, technician, and fellow, and kind of the differences between them. So we offer a variety, so we can bring in a variety of people. We only offer one of these. We're only going to bring in people who can qualify for that one type of job. We have three, right? Versatile. Interns, usual eight to ten weeks. Sometimes they're college students for the SIP position, that scientist in part. We find that they usually graduated college, but it's still a shorter term, and it's uh, in the mud class. So interns are specialists because they only have so many weeks with us. They really need to dive into a subject to get that meaningful knowledge out of it. Um, in the other types we offer is science communication and field ecology, and those we try to work with the students. Those are typically in college pursuing a degree um, and try to figure out what they're aiming to do after college and try to give them a taste of it or whatever they're missing. We try to fill that for them. They do participate and contribute to student content through blog posts, social media um, contributions, but also they give an end of season public presentation. They are funded from outside SCUDIC, which is quite unique for us. Um, the SIP positions, as I stated, that actually runs through AmeriCorps, to my knowledge. And if you're a current college student and you're working at SCUDIC, your college is supporting you. Across all of these, though, SCUDIC does provide housing at no cost to anyone in any of these positions who lives on our campus or here on MPI, um, which we'll get to in our next one with the technician. This one is our most popular position for people to apply to, and we have seven of them this year, so it's the most popular we've hired. It's a five-month position running from around June to around November, and this year is quite interesting. We have two different types. This is novel SCUDIC. We have a restoration technicians. There's three of them. They live here on the island and work really closely with National Park Service. I think they have the most contact time with the park um, of any of our staff, and it's really great and awesome to see that happening. And they live here, um, their work takes place here. They're working on the restoration projects here in Great Meadow, on the summits. So it made good sense to move them closer to their work. Otherwise, they have that one hour drive there and back to get. So we're versatile as good as well. Um, and the more uh, traditional experience at Scudic is to be a general ecology technician. This was the type I was for two years. They can participate in up to 15 projects in their five months. So it really truly is a generalist. And for those folks, we love when they say, I just graduated college and don't really have a vibe of what I want to do, but I want to do it all. They're like, great, let's give you five months of a patchwork of projects. They contribute to student content just the same. They actually participate in the Acadia Science Symposium, which is right around the corner. And these folks are funded through a patchwork of grants and task agreements, which represents all those different projects they get involved with. The last one listed here is our newest position. It's the fellowship. These are 10-month positions. We host three of them. Last year was our first cohort. This year's our second. And we host one of science research, one science communicator, and one environmental educator. They all participate in the Acadia Science Symposium. And in fact, this year on October 11th, they'll be hosting and facilitating the virtual 
free symposia uh, content. So zoom in if you want to meet some of our fellows. And these folks are funded through the generosity of Jim and Kathy Jarrow. So we often call them Jarrow Fellows. They have a much longer, it's Acadia Early Career Fellows in, and then their type, Science Research, Science Com. So these are the positions we offer here at Scooter, there at Scudic. And what are we looking for when we look for these people? I've already said the interns are currently pursuing their bachelor degree. That's for the communicator and field ecology internships. For AmeriCorps or the SIP position, AmeriCorps does set the eligibility requirements. They're pretty lenient. There's an age restriction and how many times you can do an AmeriCorps position. That's about all that they're restricted by for applications. On the technicians, as I said, they're interested in working outdoors. They're familiar with the place and the mission. Uh, we like if they understand they're working at a nonprofit within a park, but we understand if that's a little confusing to start. And they're often seeking many opportunities, like I said. And most of these folks come to us two weeks after they've walked across the stage to get their diploma. So it's a really quick change from school to work. And finally, our fellows, they've also earned their bachelor's degree, but they typically have a strong interest in a specific field and they come to us wanting to expand on that. And with that, they're able to work a little bit more independently because they come to us with some skills. So do the techs, to be fair, but the techs usually come to us wanting to grow all these different skills, whereas the fellows are like, I kind of know my path and I really want to charge time. So that's who we're hiring behind those positions. What do we offer all these folks? We can promise that we'll have work that takes place in diverse and dynamic ecosystems, collaboration with not only the park, and the, you know, their own cohort. Half of these photos have a mixture of interns and techs in them, um, but also support from a seasoned uh, staff here at Scudic and within the park. And we're very grateful that, like I said, the restoration technicians have been working with the plant crew here uh, side by side. And it's been really great to hear all of the work they've had and learning from being next to a park manager, which is awesome. We also offer that work that aligns within specific interests or goals. So in science communication, we're open to almost any medium you want to work in. We're very grateful that we've actually started a podcast that's good. It's run through the National Park Service. These are fairly rare, as we learned in the Park Service. We kind of had to convince them to let us have one. But uh, it's really great. And that top photo there, that our fellow this year recording um, roll out in the field with a Second century steward fellow, so a good interaction there as well. Be on the lookout for the second thing we manage. Science research, we have like three buckets we usually work within. It's marine ecology, bird ecology, and restoration ecology. But there are plenty of fun side quests, which don't fit in that bucket, but we do collect data for. I can touch on one of those in a second. And environmental education is to learners of all ages, but there is emphasis on working with those C students, which are middle schoolers. Back to a lot of text. But in those buckets, I just wanted to touch on how this work relates to the park and the most like um, closely aligned projects. And science communication is that podcast, Seed of Trees. It's the first season is out. You can enjoy listening to it on Apple Music. We also write a plethora of written posts online and in covering the work experience and just general moments in Acadia. And we participate in that science symposium. So if you show up on the 18th at Scudic, you'll get to hear from a lot of the people filling that tech and uh, fellow role, hear about their work. The science one is really kind of easy. So we'll work through it. Restoration, you've heard of our summit work this year. It's uh, Save Our Summits was a big event we held, getting soil to the top of some of who don't have auto roads. Um, that's been a big effort. Uh, Chris Nadeau's to revegetate the summit of Acadia. They've also been working intensely on invasive plant management, namely um, blocking buckthorn, frangel, and walnut has been a big focus. And that's mostly in Bass Harbor and Great Meadow. And I believe Gilmore Meadow as well. I'm not visited at this, I thought. So lots in the restoration. And those are both brand new projects for this year with Scudix uh, lead and really collaboration between National Park Service, 
and scoot egg. And previous years, you may notice the revegetation on Cadillac. So we're really expanding on a project that already existed. In the marine realm, the things that touch the park mostly is the, the mud flat work or soft bedding and biodiversity. It's a delightful ecosystem to get into. And we're working closely with harvesters in the area, which I think is really special. It's kind of morphed into a community science project because the harvesters are starting to really trust us and come out in the field and ask questions that drive our science. So that's a really interesting aspect. And then NEXA is a yearly monitoring of our intertidal across many field stations. And we do ours right off the Scoot Point action. So the side of not the dangerous rocky side. For the bird work, we have Sea Watch, which monitors the migratory birds that go past Scooted Point every fall. It's happening right now in the morning time. I believe there's people out there five days a week. We will be publishing it soon because we're actually expanding on that. So I'll get to in the next follow. -up. We also have involvement with Hawk Watch, which has been happening on the summit of Cadillac for over, I believe, 25 years. It's a long data collection. Um, Timeline, but that work is very similar, except instead of seabirds from the point, it's hawks from Cadillac Mountain doing their migratory um, southern travel. And then our final one is our recording work. And this has a few phases to it, but what I want to highlight is we have a fellow this year, Brooke, who's been putting ARUs or acoustic recording units out in those restoration areas that Chris and his team are working and kind of integrating those two skills. She's a fellow who came to us being like, I want to record birds. <laughs> we thought, how do we put that in with our work? And I think we found a pretty seamless way to do that. For the biodiversity side, we participate at the BioBlitzes at Wild or BioBlitzes at Surdemont for the Wild Acadia project, which is led by Friends of Acadia FOA. We've been running those biolenses and collecting observations since 2020 in the area. We're hoping to compile them into a visualization this winter so we can finally show off all of the data we have. And just to note, Sierra de Mont is the same area that has great meadow. So we've been collecting those observations in a restoration area, very specifically on the trails surrounding the meadow. Um, and then Dragonfly Mercury, that's one of those side quests that I was talking about. It doesn't really fit with our other buckets, but we collect the data for Dragonfly Mercury here in the park. So for a few days in the summer, we hand our techs, you know, dip nets and waders, and they go do something that, unlike everything else, they do the rest of the summer. And those are those, that's how you build up to 15 projects, really, is those two-day projects. So on the education side, we have C, the Scudic Education Adventure, where we assist with it by staffing it with a fellow. Also, they're on our campus. And it's just delightful to have a gaggle of middle schoolers and high vis desks walking around all school year. And then Sea Watch, we're expanding it this year to include some more interpretive aspects. If you've ever visited Hot Watch, there's signage. Sometimes there's a spare uh, bird counter who's willing to turn around and talk to the public. And we're hoping to kind of bring that experience over to Sea Watch, um, not at the sunrise one. But we'll do it starting at 10 or so, so folks can uh, come out bright and early and see some birds with us. And someone in the middle, that floating block, I couldn't quite place it either way. And but it's kind of in the middle, so I'll put it there. <laughs> We involve ourselves with the sea level, sea level rise monitoring. Um, that's through NDI Historical Society we're partnering with on the landscape change project. Sorry, I haven't said those words in a hot second. And you'll see a picture there is our fellow Brooke and an intern Catherine tabling at NDI Biological Laboratory to really, I put it in the education because our goal is to get awareness to this. But at the same time, we do collect data of photographs of king tides. So it really has two legs on it. And then Earthwatch citizen scientists, which is special to me, I coordinate the Earthwatch groups. There's one right now at Sierra Mont collecting data. And those are similarly in the middle. We do field work with them, and those are purely science research moments. But along the trail, often these people have not been to the Northeast, and I'll just educate them about our trees along the way. It really turns into a big support. So 
the final Spudic offers is the opportunity to spend time living in coastal Maine and within Acadia National Park or just adjacent for those living on MDI. We have inspirational surroundings with dramatic coastline adjacent to so many different ecosystems. We have community support from within Scudic, from the park, from the fact that in the summertime here, something's happening every weekend, folks can get involved, and then continued learning through those bird biologists or flute players that come to visit Scudic, where we're able to get involved with those programs free of charge of staff and attend them, which we learn a lot. Um, I think this is extra special. If you check the Scoop web page, one of our technicians just released their blog post, which is every time they, anyone who works at Scoop has to write a blog post of something at their time. And a student that came from Tennessee and went to school in Ohio wrote about wetlands because she had never been in one. And her blog post is wonderful because she didn't even realize she was walking into one and the ground got soft. And then she started clicking in and realizing she had learned about this in college but never been in one. And had a great moment with some sun new plants and carnivorous uh, picture plants. So inspirational is quite well exemplified right now in the Scooter webpage by Ella Colbert's blog post. So just a note, I want to include some folks. They have all of these great experiences, and then anywhere from 10 weeks to five months to 10 months, we wave goodbye as they head on to their next adventure. And I wrote and reached out to some of the previous ETPs from Scudic. You have to respond to them where they are now. You'll see they're either pursuing PhDs, they've moved not that far up the coast to go work at Downey's Institute. They are, and Anna is out west in the southwest, moving around, but working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Liz is, I'm fairly certain that's a park unit, but it's a military one, so those always kind of confuse me at first, but I think she's wearing the gray and green. <laughs> and is a National Park Service site. Awesome. And then Michaela is also in a park unit doing a being a science educator with Nature Bridge at Yosemite. So many places you can end up. And I'd like to also point out Tessa is the one in the mud up on top, and she's now working in the mud, but for Downey's Institute. So the skills really transfer directly into what she did. So that's a early career. Those are the positions we offer. I just wanted to give a little glimpse into how they end up at Scudic. There's some stats from last year's hiring cycle. We had over 270 applicants for 14 positions. We weren't anticipating that. It was a delightful surprise in some ways. Um, of those, we did over 28 interviews to find our 14. And I find it very interesting. And in times past, the schools we represented is a little bit lower. Over 146 different schools had an applicant um, applying with us, which I didn't at that point. <laughs> so this is a, a slide where I, I won't gatekeep how we got these people to apply for us. This is where we posted the job. The first three bullet is TAMU, Texas A&M, most well-known job board, I think, in natural sciences, brought us almost 25% of all applicants. Networking brought us another 16, and my personal favorite, Conservation Job Board, brought us another 14. Together, that's over half of those 270 people from just three sources. So do feel free to screenshot, take a picture, click it in for next hiring season, because I'd love to see these boards grow. Also, just a note, kind of highlighting the Scudic's growth in the past year for, uh, I'll read the title, 2016 to 2023, and these are exclusively technicians. I don't have the data compiled for fellows and interns yet, but you'll see we've, we've shot up quite a bit. There was an 80% rise and then a 91. Um, I, I'm not alone in this effort, but I did start working on the hiring efforts right there in the middle. Right when we shot up the first time, I had a hand in posting the job that year, and last year, I was the one posting the job almost fully. So I think we've had this period of growth in our organization and I got it to mirror in our applicants, but it's purely because I'm the first person able to spend time at a desk, looking up these job boards, finding the sources, tailoring job ads and getting out there. So I think our capacity is growing. You can really see it here. 
I'm very excited to remake this graph in about a year, and I'm a little scared of what the number will get to because we have to read it. <laughs> so just going back to that, why didn't they not advance slide? It's kind of a sadder one. It's pointing out many of the barriers that we have in natural sciences. I remade it with this one, but why Scoot it works to kind of dismantle some of those. Um, some folks, they can't take a lower wage. I think we actually have some pretty competitive wages. I was once in a meeting with many of my ECPs. We were talking about this job. And one of them said that the top of her staff is it paid the most. And I was like, happy days for student. That's awesome to hear. Um, often you need housing to work in this field. We have it. We have a Navy base. We're very fortunate and grateful that we can just house them in quite comfortable apartments. You can't justify the travel or you don't have a car. We go and get people from the airport and bring them back. We'll loan out cars for you to go get groceries. We want you to come here with or without that ability to transport yourself. Lack of stability, can't really fight that too hard because we're, we're offering seasonal jobs. But what we do offer is loads of support. We're willing to write any reference letters you need. And this year we were able to have a group resume review session where I pulled in all of the seasonal, no, yes, seasonal, and all of our staff scientists who have been hiring for years. And I had them review resumes and that included their time at Scudic. So we're able to really represent their time at Scudic well in hopes that they get that next job a little bit easier. And then a competitive job market. And it's again, kind of difficult to support entirely, but we do so by offering those variety of positions. We're not just hiring techs. If you're still in college, we can hire you. If you don't want to be a generalist and you have a specialization that lands with a fellow, we can hire you. So there's more opportunities to join our group. So I have all this great knowledge of Scudic now. Maybe you had it before. Maybe not really did. But if you want to continue to learn more about us and the experiences and future opportunities, we do a field work Friday post every Friday on our Instagram and Facebook. Sounds a little kooky, but those are pictures directly from the field of techs, interns, and fellows. You kind of see their experiences throughout the summer. I encourage you to join our monthly e-newsletter because that's where our job postings will probably end up pretty fast after they're out. I would love to see many people at the Acadia Science Symposium, all three dates offered this year. Um, the first and second are the 11th is virtual, 17th is hybrid. Sorry, I'm looking at it. Yeah, there's an evening keynote. Yes. And then the 18th is also somewhat hybrid, but the poster sessions are in person. So I encourage you to make the drive out and see all of our wonderful science uh, folks. And it's not just us who present, many folks. Um, and then keep an eye on that web webpage for job postings. Easiest way to do that is just follow us on social media or get the newsletter. We'll let people know. We're pretty loud when we have a position open. Finally, I just wanted to thank, I've been saying we offer support, but not saying who offers it. So I wanted to thank the entire screen team, Hannah, Nick, Seth, Kyle, Catherine, Emma, and Chris. Lovely, easy names to run through. Park staff, like I said, we've had folks working more closely with park staff this year than any other year it feels. So they've been excellent support. And the wonderful crew we have here it makes Scooter a really great place, not only to be, but to launch a career. Questions? <laughs> Yeah. They should take you on the road as a recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had uh, that 159 surprised us this year. And I think we were almost like, whoa, what if it goes higher? <laughs> yeah. I, actually, so I was going to, Emma can chime in if there end up being questions online. But I was going to ask, do you, have you thought about like where? Like, of the applicants, are you getting the applicants that you're interested in? The number is big, but are yeah. you thinking about changing the recruitment, or is that does that look like you're getting the kind of pool that you want? So that 159 was for technicians. That's our largest pool we get. I like that to be big because we are looking for those people who don't have, you know, they're, they're writing, they don't know what they would like to do. Um, what I think we're going to do a little differently is I'm going to implement an applicant tracking system this year, which 
it, AI will not review anything, but it'll just organize it a bit better for us. We didn't anticipate 159. Had we done so, we would have left more time to review, but many of us were reviewing up to 400 applicants this spring. It really, we didn't see it coming. This next year, we'll see it coming. Right. So yeah, but not a change on the parameters around it, but just a change on how they work through us. No, but I mean, are you like getting the right audiences finding the jobs? I believe so. Okay. When I went through, when we got hit with 159, I was quickly like, oh no, let me go through and just see if people aren't eligible for whatever reason. Is there, is there an easy skim? And I was only able to pull like 40, which I was happy about because that left us with, you know, 119 wonderful applicants. But I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So I feel as if the fact that I was only able to skim off that many, it, the others I felt like they were qualified enough that they should proceed and get you know, reviewed. So yeah. I think so. I think we're just getting a lot of word of mouth. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Any other questions? Because you're getting so many applicants, are there like thoughts of expanding at all? Like, what is your capacity there? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think those thoughts are happening now because our fellowship still feels really new. It's only our second year. But I think if we were to continue expansion, we would more applicants just keep on flooding in. Mm -hmm. We'd look into it. But you no, know, I feel like our staff and our, our ECPs are pretty well matched right now. I'd be a little cautious to add so many seasonal positions that can't get that mentorship because there's too many. So I think it's going to be a little bit of a balancing act if we, if we do it. Um, and you were talking, we were talking before um, about like making it like a program and having like a cohort and stuff. Like, what are your thoughts? Like, what would you want that to look like? Yeah, that's a great question. I would like for the cohort to form, I would like them to work together in a more like, usually it's opportunistic, mm -hmm. like a, hey, I heard so and so is going to the mud flat, can I go to the mud flats? Instead, I'd like to send them all out maybe one day and, and figure out who's good at it and then assign them those tasks. I just like to get them to working together more mm -hmm. often as a whole in community events. Um, but we've been growing in community aspect more this year. The resume review was new. We were able to actually secure a puffin tour that we chartered with our whole crew on the boat out to Pete and Ann. Um, so that was delightful. And those were moments where the restoration crew who was on MPI finally like got to integrate with everyone else who's at Scudic, and it was pretty rare that they do get those moments. So I think increasing those moments of contact would be my first goal for creating a type of work. Anyway. Um, do you have ways that you're evaluating how successful or like the program is for the for the participants for the techs and interns and fellows? Yeah. You thought about that. Yes. So I actually just put out the mid-season evaluation two weeks ago. I'm awaiting all the responses where we kind of check in, like, how did our training suit you? We've been doing the job two months. Did the training come in use? You know. Each community event was broken down. So we do check in with them for the mid season eval. And then at the very end, no one leaves Scooter without an exit interview where we get kind of the lowdown on your experience as a whole. And we do meet as a group after a season um, and kind of go over all of that and kind of figure out, you know, this was said at least four times. That's that's something we're going to write down and maybe work on fixing or just changing. Maybe it wasn't a fix, which is something that's delivered on the peak. Those are our wage. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? What's that? Emma, it sounds like no questions online. No, none online. Nick just says he wants to apply for one of these positions. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we have like a forest fellow. <laughs> it's called a hobbit. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thanks for giving us the, the overview. Emma, you can yeah. stop the recording. Yeah, I hand you back. Thank you for. Thank you.